I heard this from an acquaintance of mine, and it's really stayed with me over the years. Maybe it'll do the same for you too. A few years ago, there was a big earthquake in Hokkaido, and the island was severely damaged by the tsunami it caused. Hi, Jay here. I think the writer might be referring to the Hokkaido Nansei Oki earthquake, which occurred on the 12th of 2021. It was a 7.8 quake that produced one of the largest tsunamis in Japanese history. Okushiri Island took the full force of nature and suffered extensive damage. Back to the story. This acquaintance of mine was on a transportation ship at the time the tsunami struck. I should say that we work in the same industry. We chose a life at sea. He was anchored in Hakodate, also in Hokkaido. So he hurriedly offered his assistance in any rescue efforts. He put himself forward to support any disaster relief missions. He started out working on land-based rescue efforts, but quickly was drafted in to help out at sea. There are many missing people out there. They've probably been pulled out by the tide and we need to go in search of them, he was told. Due to his work background, he had no problem getting to work. As a result of his search, more than a dozen were found, but all of them had sadly passed away. With a heavy heart and the bodies on board, he headed back to port. He reported his tragic findings to the organizer of the disaster relief mission, and he was asked a favor in return. I want you to keep these bodies on board for the night. We are not equipped to deal with them at the moment due to the urgent demands of our rescue operations. Is there any way you could do that? Well, since the ship was a transportation ship, he wasn't short of space. He agreed, wanting to help out in any way he could. He decided that their resting place would be at the bottom of the ship. There was a vehicle hangar down there, which was pretty wide. Also, it was cooler down there, which of course would help with preservation. I can't imagine how he felt having to deal with what to do with those bodies. He covered the bodies with blankets and then a large plastic sheet and left them down there in the vehicle bay overnight. His crew lit incense sticks and prayed for the souls of the victims. They all wanted to keep the incense burning overnight as a mark of respect and to ease the passing into what lies beyond. But they were worried that the sticks might burn out during the night, so he and his crew took shifts to make sure the incense wouldn't burn out. My acquaintance noted how tired his crewmates were and offered to watch over the incense sticks from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. to give others a rest. They had been taking turns helping with rescue efforts and then watching the sticks when 2 a.m. came around, it was incredibly dark on board that ship. He said that due to specific controlled lights, the only light source that was on down there with the bodies were these small red LED lights. It didn't make for the best atmosphere. He said he felt as if he was in a haunted house. He told me that the smell the bodies were beginning to give off was difficult to deal with too. He said it was like a strong fishy odor. He was all alone down there, in the dark, with the dead. Once again, I cannot imagine how he felt. I don't know if I could have done what he and his crew did. He was scared. He happily admitted that to me. According to him, he was so scared that he sat with his back facing the bodies under that plastic sheet. He didn't want to look at them. As soon as it was 4am, he raced to his feet to get out of the vehicle hangar and changed places with one of his crewmates. He had to climb the long case of metal stairs to get from the vehicle hangar to the quarters on the second floor where his crewmates were sleeping. There was a large mirror at the top of the stairs. It was big enough to see a whole body, he said. He did his best not to look in the mirror. He didn't want a chance seeing something otherworldly. Mirrors are creepy enough in a darkened room or if you wake up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, but they must have been even creepier in his situation. He said he went past it slowly and silently in the dim red light. When he was finally at the point where he was about to pass by the mirror, he for some reason decided to go against his fears 
and glance at himself side on for a moment. He said he did that because for the briefest of moments, he sensed that he wasn't alone. He hadn't felt like that before, that moment. Of course he was scared of being down there with the bodies and the incense burning, but he had felt like he was on his own. When he was at the top of those stairs by the mirror, he had felt as if someone was close by. He got back to the crew quarters and woke up his crewmate to take over for him. He then started to get ready to get some sleep. He took off his work clothes in preparation for the following day, and when he looked down at his shirt, he froze in horror. There was a faint, wet handprint on his back. He had no idea how it had gotten there. When he was alone with the bodies, he couldn't help but think that he wasn't alone. After all. I like to think of that handprint as a mark of thanks. A hand reaching out. From beyond, perhaps. This happened roughly 30 years ago, and it's something that I've only told a few select people about up until now. It happened one night me and my girlfriend at the time drove to the beach. After work I went to pick her up, and we headed straight to the beach. However, when we arrived at the beach it was already pitch black. I mean, we should have known better not to go so late, but for some reason we both really wanted to go that night after work. It was roughly about 10pm by the time we got out of my car. We were talking in the car, eating our McDonald's we had stopped to get on the way, looking out at the darkness. At least we could see the waves rolling against the beach. That was worth the drive, I suppose. I can't stay out too long, I have work early in the morning. My girlfriend didn't respond when I said that. I thought she might have been annoyed at me for saying that I had to leave so soon. I looked over at her and I noticed that she seemed to be transfixed on something out at sea. What is it? I asked her. She didn't answer, so I looked in the direction she was looking in, and I saw a strong beam of light swaying across the waves, far from the shoreline. Is that a squid fishing boat or something? I don't know, I said to her. That's not a squid fishing boat. The light isn't right. Hey, don't you think it's getting closer? I looked out at sea, and I agreed. That bright light definitely seemed to be getting closer. It was shaking as it moved along the waves. It looked as if it was heading right for the shore. Maybe it's a fireball. Hi, Jay here. Fireballs are like will-o'-the-wisp kind of paranormal phenomena in Japan. Visually a, a little like an orb or something like that. These balls of fire appear at night and are said to be the souls that have been separated from the earthbound body. Back to the story. If it was a fireball, then it wouldn't shine so bright, surely. That's 100% a UFO. She said it so excitedly, I was kind of taken aback. I didn't know until that point that she had an interest in the paranormal or the occult. I looked at the mysterious light a little closer, and she was right. It wasn't a flickering kind of dim light you might expect when you think of fireballs. It was a strong, bright searchlight shining down at the waves. I heard myself absent-mindedly agreeing with her by saying, Yeah, I guess that could be a UFO. At this point, the light was only about 200 to 300 meters away from us. That might sound a little strange, so let me just say that the beach we drove to was a very secluded one. The shore wasn't that far away from where you could park your car. We liked this beach because there was never anyone around at night, and there wasn't much light in the area. It was perfect for a nice, secluded evening date. As the light of what we thought was a UFO approached, I noted that I wasn't scared. I just thought to myself, wow, this could be a UFO. This is a once in a lifetime kind of deal. And then my girlfriend said, hey, isn't that light getting to the shoreline now? Yeah, it was. I snapped out of that state of awe and I began to panic. I saw the light go over the waves at the shore and I knew that it was about to illuminate the sand on the beach next. 
The gravity of this situation set in for me. Put your seatbelt on. We gotta get out of here. I started the ignition and I pulled a U-turn and then drove out of the beach area at breakneck speed. As I drove, my girlfriend continued to stare at the light. I heard her call out in a frightened voice. That light is shining right where we were parked up. I was really panicking. I was driving for our lives. I felt like a rally driver. And at one point I drifted out onto the sand. Finally, we made it back onto roads which were well lit and a sense of security. We lost down by the shore, slowly came back to us. I pulled over and I remember I had goosebumps all over my arms. When I took my hands off the steering wheel, I noticed that they were drenched in sweat. We spent the rest of the journey in a hushed silence. I think neither of us knew what to say to comfort the other. If she was anything like me, then she was replaying it over and over in her head. That weird overhead light advancing on us. It was headed straight for us. And moreover, it seemed to be looking at where we were parked. It was like it was coming for us. I dropped her off at her place. And when I got back to mine, I just laid down on my bed. I was there wondering if what happened truly happened or if it was some kind of dream or misunderstanding. I met my girlfriend the following day and I asked her outright. That wasn't a dream, was it? No, of course not. I was there with you, she replied. She seemed a little skeptical that day. I don't know how to describe it. I wonder what that was, she asked rhetorically. Last night she had been so sure that it was a UFO, but now she was questioning herself, it seemed. Of course, I didn't know what it was myself, so I didn't have any form of answer for her. Well, that's where it sort of ended, I guess. One thing I can tell you is I ended up marrying that girlfriend, and 20 years on from that night at the beach, the memory of that strange, bright overhead searchlight faded away. That was until one night we were watching a TV show about Japanese nationals' abduction cases. For those unaware, there are a large number of missing person cases, which are tied to North Korea. Approximately 470 people have been abducted, and according to the Japanese government, as of November 2021, abduction cannot be ruled out for a further 873 individuals. During this TV show, they showed a map which had all the locations where they believed that the abductees were captured and kidnapped. What did we see on the map? Well, none other than that secluded beach we drove to that night 20-something years ago. I looked at my wife, and she was staring at the TV, stunned. We didn't encounter a UFO that night. We likely encountered a North Korean ship coming to shore. They could have easily seen us pull in and park up. I felt a chill race down my spine when I realized that we could have ended up as kidnapped victims. If I didn't drive off when I did, we could have been abducted. Since that day, whenever North Korea appears in the news, I think to myself how lucky I am to live the peaceful life I have with my wife. The realization that it wasn't a UFO, but people with evil intentions was hands down the scariest moment of my life. My grandpa was a fisherman. He began sailing the seas at 10 years old and continued until he was in his 80s. May I add, despite the wishes of his family. I wanted to share a few of the things he told me about his time at sea. He said it wasn't uncommon to encounter something strange when sailing the sea at night. He said that he thought he could see the souls of the departed as spirits. He was full of interesting and spooky stories. He painted images with his words of gods and monsters rising from the seas under cover of darkness. I loved his stories. I couldn't wait to hear more of them. I always pressed him for more information and detail. I wanted to know all I could about what was out there in the open ocean. 
I wanted to see it through his eyes. I think I went a little too far with it one day because he turned to me with a stern look on his face and then he said, There are certain areas of this world we as people shouldn't touch. I was a little too young to understand the meaning at the time, but I guess I understand it better these days. When talking about the sea, he was full of metaphor and philosophy. He often mentioned his golden rule of indifference, but more about that later. According to my grandfather, ghosts were at the very edge of the realm of our understanding and our limits. It's like we could almost reach out and touch them if you were either lucky or unlucky enough to get so close depending on your viewpoint. He occasionally told me about ghosts and the spirits of the sea. According to my grandfather, spirits seek light, not the dark that the movies and novels have them hiding in. Light is a symbol of the world, of the living, and it is possibly their desire to return to our world that attracts them to that light. This seems so plausible to me, especially if you consider how dark and vast the sea is. Those lost at sea, stranded out there in the pitch black, why wouldn't they be attracted to the light of passing ships? That's why it seemed like sometimes spirits visited my grandfather's squid fishing boat. Hi, Jay here. I think it's important to note at this stage that Japanese squid fishing boats are full of lights to attract the squid. Here's a picture of one in action. Please keep that in mind. Back to the story. He said a friend of his saw misty, shadowy figures advance and try to join him on deck from the sea. Some had extended hands and fingers, grasping for the lights on his ship. However, Grandpa said that he himself never really had a strong ability to sense the presence of spirits. He said that he saw shapes, sometimes facial features in those shapes, mouths talking out of wisps of mist in the dark. He said he wanted to speak to them, sometimes because they looked like they were suffering. But neither him nor the spirits at sea could communicate with one another. That's when he decided to live by one important principle when encountering anything weird and wonderful at sea. The golden rule of indifference. Dealing with spirits half-heartedly would cause trouble. He didn't want to invite anything or irk anything. So he figured the best way to ensure his safety at sea would be to remain indifferent. Of course he felt fear, and most importantly sorrow, for the spirits calling out in the dark sea. He had heard wailing voices travel over the sound of waves, the tormented souls of those lost out there. He reminded himself of his rule of indifference and did his best to ignore them. He said it was very difficult to do that as he wasn't sure if any were genuine cries from the living. He went very far out at sea to catch squid, so it didn't seem likely. One day one of his friends had an accident at sea. He went overboard and although his crew pulled him back on board and took him to hospital, he was already gone. He didn't make it. Many of his friends gathered at his funeral to mourn his death. He was a pillar in their society. Despite everyone's collective sadness, work had to continue. So the following day, my grandfather set out to sea to fish like any other day. About half a year went by and my grandfather was out at sea. He was sat cross-legged on the deck of his vessel, watching the dark water lit up by his squid lights below. He said that he suddenly felt very sleepy for a reason unknown to him. His eyelids felt as if they were made of lead. He was fighting the urge to sleep. While trying to fight this unknown feeling of extreme tiredness, he sensed a presence behind him. He felt as if someone was stood there. Then he heard a voice. He was too exhausted to turn and face that voice, but the voice called him by his nickname, Tetsu. I need to get back to shore. I can't get back. My grandpa said that he recognized the voice, but he didn't know where it came from. And then it came to him. It was his friend who passed. Help me, please, the voice said. And with that, grandpa opened his eyes. He didn't know until that point that he had fallen asleep. I understand, my grandpa heard himself mutter. He instantly spun around 
and the presence he felt behind him had completely disappeared. Somehow, my grandpa was convinced that the spirit of his friend who communicated with him in his dreamlike state was still on board his ship. He went to his crewmates to tell them about what he had just experienced. He had two others on board with him. One of them said that they just so happened to be in roughly the same area where his friend went overboard. So when they heard my grandpa's testimony, they all agreed to call off fishing and instantly return to port. That was the one and only time that my grandpa broke his golden rule of indifference. My grandpa had heard legends of ships carrying souls back to shore, so he wanted to do it. Some said that even though the body might have been recovered, the soul was still at sea, so it relied on the help of the living to carry it home. They say some spirits lack the means to get home by themselves. They might have died far from home. That is why sometimes you hear of taxi and bus drivers speaking of ghostly passengers. That might help you understand, son. Perhaps my ship was used as a taxi. Grandpa told me with a laugh, and then he looked out at the ocean and sighed. I want to be out at the sea until the moment I die, he said. He seemed reluctant to quit his job as a fisherman. Was he jealous of those who lost their lives at sea? I'm not sure. He was a very interesting man. This happened when I was in the fourth year of elementary school. I joined a local school volunteer group when I was that age. Just to give you some background on what that entailed, it was a program led by university students. Basically, we would volunteer to clean up litter, do some gardening, stuff like that to help out the community. It wasn't all work though. We got some really great camping trips because of our efforts. I enjoyed it. This experience takes place during that year's summer vacation. We were set to be camping out by an abandoned forestry school, deep out in the mountains. I don't remember all that well since I was really young at the time, so some details are going to be either missing or a little sparse. There was a river that flowed near that abandoned school, and we elementary school students were having a lot of fun playing and swimming in it. The river flowed upstream, and there were lots of large rocks and stones on the riverbed. There were some jutting out of the water too. Although the current was pretty strong, we were still able to swim there. We didn't really care about distance swimming, we were just paddling around and just having fun. The water was pretty deep, so some of us were looking for a place to dive in. I also realized at that point that it would be possible to swim under the little bridge they had over the river. I don't know if we were supposed to be allowed to do or what we did, but the university students didn't seem to want to stop us. They seemed a bit distracted. I doubt this kind of thing would be allowed nowadays. My neighbor joined our camping trip. I will just call her A. Now A wasn't the quickest learner, and that's about as gently as I can put it. Because she was a bit slow, she got bullied by other students. When I was diving in the river, I saw that A was struggling to keep her head above water level. I dove in, and I was underwater, thinking. She looks like she's struggling. She probably hasn't swam much before. Classic A. I think I might have thought something meaner, but that's either here nor there. When I came up, I noticed that she was really struggling, and it looked like she was on the verge of drowning. I yelled to my campmates on the shore for help, but none of them were reacting quickly enough. While I was about to yell louder, I felt something clasp against my leg. A, who was drowning, had grabbed a hold of my leg and was pulling me down with her. She was a lot stronger than I thought she would be. I guess fear for one's life can bring out hidden strength unknown to the individual. 
I was desperately trying to get to the surface. A's hand tightened its grip around my ankle. I even felt her long hair getting tangled around my leg and between my toes. It was gross. I felt so breathless. I felt as if I was going to die. I was in complete panic mode. I had no time to think of her. It didn't even enter my mind. All I could think of was my own survival. Although I knew it would be painful, I decided to open my eyes and look down. I wasn't ready for what I saw. I didn't see an elementary school student grabbing a hold of my ankle. I saw a bone white, pale woman grabbing onto me. Her dark hair swayed in the water like seaweed. I remember thinking that very clearly because I thought straight after that I wasn't in the sea, I was in a river. It was just such a mad thought. I could see her other pale hand reach out and attempt to grab my other ankle. If this woman got a hold of my other ankle, I knew that I would be done for. A lot happened in the space of a couple of seconds, but the thought that jumped to the forefront of my mind was, that is not A. I felt a fear that I haven't had the displeasure of feeling again. A feeling of pure, disgusting fear. A fear so terrible that it was almost incomprehensible. Fight or flight. I kicked at that woman as hard as I could with my free foot. Eventually I felt her grip loosen, and then I used the last of my strength to dart to the surface and scramble onto shore. When I emerged from the river, everyone was looking at me. I saw A, and when I stopped spluttering and I caught my breath, I yelled at her, weren't you drowning just now? She didn't say anything, but all the other students almost in unison, told me that I was the one drowning, and no one else was anywhere near me. If I hadn't kicked that pale woman so hard when I did, I might not have made it out of that river. When I think about how close I was to being dragged down to the depths by that woman, it still sends a shiver up my spine. I'm not sure who she was, but I believe her to be otherworldly. I think she was some kind of spirit, yokai or cryptid that preys on victims in that river. Perhaps she was a victim herself. It was one camping experience I don't think I'll ever forget. This happened to my dad while he was with some of his friends. There were three of them in total. If anyone's interested in the location involved in this story, it's Ube City, Yamaguchi Prefecture, Onoko Lake, or Ono Lake. It was just before summer during the rainy season. My dad was having dinner with his two friends. They were all talking together, and one of his friends said, Do you know what? Now that it's firefly season, I've just realized I haven't ever seen one. My dad and his friend couldn't believe what they were hearing. They at first thought that he was lying because fireflies were so easy to see each season where they lived. Well, they are probably a little rarer these days. My dad then said, well, if we head out to Lake Ono, we can probably see some right now. There's probably tons of them out there. After my dad suggested that, the three of them got all amped up and headed out to see the fireflies. They piled into my dad's car and headed towards a beautiful park next to Lake Ono. They were sure to find those fireflies. Sounds wild, doesn't it? They got out of the car and found a bench to sit down on. They sat there drinking beers and talking. Obviously, my dad wasn't drinking. Well, that's what he told me. He didn't want to get in trouble for drunk driving. They sat there joking around, saying how they looked a little odd to be sat there in the middle of the night and stuff. But luckily, there was no one else in the park that night. They were in high spirits, excited to see the fireflies and enjoying their moments of seclusion. After a while, the fireflies came out and they were easy to spot. His friends were getting a little drunk at that point. They were letting loose and so was my dad. It was a night of good vibes. They watched for a while until they got a little tired of it. My dad, feeling as if it was time that they were going, 
began to get to his feet, but he felt a hand clasp around his wrist. His friend then said, You don't want to get up yet, as he tugged at his wrist. My dad stared at him, wondering what the hell was going on, wondering what kind of danger might be out there. Were they about to get rushed? He had no clue. His friend pointed behind the bench. He tried his best to disguise the fact that he was pointing. There's something freaky going on back there. What do you think it is? My dad isn't the type to worry if someone says something creepy or strange is happening. So that was almost like a relief to him. He spun around to look in the direction his friend was pointing. His friend was pointing out at Lake Ono. Are you telling me you're seeing something because I'm not seeing anything? He says to his friends. Come on, you must be able to see that. We better get going, one friend said. Yeah, let's go, agreed the other. My dad noticed that their high spirits had faded. They seemed to have completely sobered up. They all headed back to my dad's car, and once they were in the car, they started talking. My dad said, Okay, guys, what was I supposed to have seen back there? Are you seriously telling me that you couldn't see that? Jeez, you're such an old man. One friend jibed. Well, I saw it. I don't really feel well anymore. I just want to get out of this area. What's gotten into you two? All I could see was the lake and the fence that keeps people out. The handrail. What else did I miss? You didn't see the old man stood on the lake? What the hell? You guys saw that? Did they see something otherworldly? Some spirit stood on the surface of the water? Well, my dad might not have seen what they had seen, but he was good at reading the room, or in this case, the car. He decided to drive back home immediately. They needed a change of mood. My dad suggested that they go to a local bar. It was owned by one of their friends from their school days. He figured that they could get back into the groove there. Plus, they could have a beer too. They arrived at the bar and they were greeted by their friend, who listened intently to their story. They were lucky because they were the only customers in the bar that night. The barman then said he had heard of similar stories before about that lake at night. After they finished telling him what they saw, the barman then turned his back to fix them another round. And as soon as he turned his back, the front door to the bar flew open. Everyone turned around to see if there was a new customer coming into the bar, but there was no one there. Everyone was now silent. They all saw the door fly open by itself, and they were freaking out. No one made a sound. One of my dad's friends said, Have we brought something here with us? The barman grabbed some chef salt and told them to go outside and sprinkle it around the bar. This being an attempt to purify the bar and to not allow spirits in. After that, they all left and went their separate ways. My dad said that he told the president of his company about his experience once, because he knew the president was into scary stories. The president said, Well, I'm not surprised you experienced something out on that lake. During the war, there were many casualties in that area. Koreans, Koreans worked to death, were buried in coal mines in that area. That area has a very troubling history. <laughs>